Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today, and a happy International Women's Day to you all. And thank you so much for coming out on this very snowy March day, which is not normal weather. Um, we'd like to take this time to just uh, thank you for coming. I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Rothna Begum. I'm a senior researcher in the Women's Rights Division. I've worked at Human Rights Watch for almost 10 years, but longer than that in my career of about 15 years. And I worked on Iran for a long time, um, including when the Green Uprising was happening in 2009. And now we're here again with the incredible uprising of women and men regarding women's rights. I want to take, uh, thank the conduit in particular and the next gen for facilitating this critical conversation, which comes at such a crucial time. As many of you know, today, repressive governments in Iran and Afghanistan continue to impose policies that severely restrict women's rights. Following the death of a young Kurdish woman, Mahsa Jina Amini, on September 16, 2022, we have seen widespread protests take over Iran, with the leading slogan adopted from the Kurdish women's movement of women, life, freedom. Protests that began with calls for accountability against the systemic abuses of Iran's morality police and compulsory hijab laws quickly spread and evolved to demand human rights accountability across the board and fundamental change from Iran. Since taking power in Afghanistan, the Taliban have imposed a long and growing list of policies that prevent women and girls from exercising their fundamental rights, including to expression, movement, work, and education, virtually affecting all of their rights. The Taliban have not only dismantled the system that protected women from gender-based violence, but they also silenced female journalists and beat and abducted women's rights protesters who bravely chanted, bread, work, freedom from the streets. Now, despite the atrocities happening to women across both Iran and Af Afghanistan, women are uniting their voices to call for fundamental change. And every day we are seeing acts of bravery by women calling for justice and meaningful change. Even the most everyday resistance acts of walking out onto the streets without wearing the hijab. We are delighted to, call, to join you in this conversation with leading experts and advocates who are working in the field of women's rights, film and digital investigations. Now this evening is not a rigid panel or interview. We are really looking to have a sort of a fireside chat amongst the panelists here. And we're hoping it will be an informed conversation with you all that shines a light on the bravery and the incredible impact that women are having both in Iran and Afghanistan. And we're hoping that we can use today to, as an exploration for more detail on how women from different countries can inspire and empower each other to fight not just for women's rights, but how women can cross-pollinate women's movements, galvanize society, and lead with huge effectiveness the fight for broader equality and justice for every member of society. Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce my panelists. We have here Katie Polglaze. She is an investigative producer based at CNN's London Bureau. She is a part of a team that has brought open source investigative journalism to CNN for the very first time. Most recently, Katie has worked on CNN's coverage of the protests in Iran, looking at the role of social media, technology, and surveillance. We also have with us Tamana Ayazi. She was born and raised in Balkh in the northern region of Afghanistan. And she's a passionate champion of freedom of thought and human rights through the use of storytelling as a tool to advocate for equality and positive change. She is a National Geographic Explorer and assists Amnesty International in their research focused on children and women in Afghanistan. And we'll talk a little bit later about her Netflix film, In Her Hands. We also have with us Sahar Fetrat, my colleague at Human Rights Watch. She's an assistant researcher within the Women's Rights Division. She's a feminist activist born in Afghanistan, lived in Iran and Pakistan as a young refugee during the first Taliban regime and has since grown up in Kabul as her family returned to Afghanistan in the late 2006. She's incorporated her feminist views into storytelling through documentary filmmaking, and previously worked with the education unit at UNESCO in Afghanistan, advocating for literacy education for women. So maybe I'll just kick it off with a question to all of you, if that's okay. 
Now, what we're seeing is that in both sides of the border, we have Iran and Afghanistan, where the authorities have really responded with brutal force to the protests. Yet we're seeing support for the protests continue, if not thriving. So can you talk to us a little bit about why you think the women are protesting? What is driving them? And how it is that men and students are also taken to the streets in the same fight? Would like to start? I'll start. Um, thanks so much for the generous introduction, uh, Rutna. And thank you all for being here. I'd like to start uh, saying we are here to honor and celebrate the raging spirits of our sisters in Iran and Afghanistan. They are fighting the most brutal and difficult rulers and regimes right now. Um, as well as celebrating all the women around the world, all the feminists who are making this world a better place. If you feel it, it is a better place, thanks to, to them. If you don't feel it's a better place yet, yet again, thanks to them, uh, because they create questions. They make us feel like there's something wrong with the system and structures that we have right now. And to your question, um, Rotna, um, I, starting with saying more power to, to these women. Um, um, the reason they're protesting and they continue to protest. In Afghanistan, it was because um, when, when the Taliban came back to power, things changed. A lot of activists and people who uh, had access to organizations, women's rights organizations, they had to leave because they couldn't stay there anymore. Then there are other women, you know, you can't, the whole ca country could not be evacuated. So there are other women who, who uh, went out and saw that they can't work, they can't, they're not allowed to live freely, they're not allowed to be in public, they're not allowed to do anything that at least they could do uh, with, with restrictions before. Um, they came out and they protested, risking their lives, saying, work, saying bread, work, freedom. Bread, the kind of bread that they could uh, make and you know they, they could provide. Work that was theirs, that had dignity and freedom that was, uh, must be celebrated uh, uh, by all and for all. So it was a quest for freedom for every Afghan and for all the marginalized people. And um, Afghan women were the ones who championed it. Um, and, and then in Iran, it's a different story. In Iran, it's been 43 years of uh, 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 the regime's uh, challenges and ban on women, and uh, uh, this meant uh, restrictions on their freedom, this meant restrictions on their uh, uh, right to choose and uh, decide, and uh, it was a different time, but, uh, uh, but it's, it's important that they understand the value of freedom and uh, freedom for everyone and they continue to fight because uh, it's it's about time things need to change and change needs to happen right now um, thank you so much Ritna. it's uh, an honor to be here with everyone uh, Sahar summarized everything, but I would like to add that I remember interviewing one of the protesters uh, back uh, late in 2021. Uh, and I asked her why you're protesting, why you're going out under Taliban regime. And she said that we fight or we die because there is no other option left for us. Um, the people who got evacuated, they are in a safer place. Uh, but the people who are left behind, they need to fight. The Taliban, the regime, the system, until they accept that we have rights, we have uh, our own choices, and they need to respect us. Katie? Yeah, I mean, that's, I completely agree. I think it's really powerful, everything you've both just said. And I think all I can add as a journalist is that it becomes our role to then listen to what people are trying to say in country and the communication blackouts that they face. Um, it's part of our job to then try and overcome them um, and make sure that those voices are heard. And what we certainly found is that the more that there is conflict, the more that there is repression, the more important it is to us to try and get past it for us to then hear those voices. And particularly with what we've heard in Iran, the voices become more and more urgent the harder they are to hear, if that makes sense. Um, and so I think the more that people are currently talking about what's happening in Iran, Afghanistan, um, the more um, we're already winning that battle to, to hear 
at what's going on, because as you rightly said at the beginning, what's happening particularly in Iran at the moment has been going on for decades and decades. It's just that finally we are sitting and talking about it again, um, and it's happened in 2009. It happened, you know, it, it, it bubbles up in terms of our interest in those stories. But the situation and the repression and the lack of human rights for these people has been a constant thing. And it's our duty as journalists and collectively um, as activists as well to make sure that that light continues and that we continue to be aware um, of what's, what's happening there. Maybe we can talk a little bit more about that. I mean, why it's different this time round. What makes it so different? I mean, what, from what I've seen in terms of Iran, like the, one of the distinctions this time round has been that they've really united under the women's rights banner. So in Iran, you know, we've had protests multiple times, there have been several uprisings, but this is the first time when it was really sparked by the death of a woman following her arrest by the morality police for not wearing her hijab properly, according to that morality police official. But it really sparked something that really touched people. They, you know, the understanding that women's rights are human rights, right? They, they really saw it as, for the first time, understanding that women, the repression on women was so severe, it has been for so long, and yet it was never the central premise for a lot of the protests before. And this is the, for the first time we're seeing them really back that up. Um, and we're seeing people, and now it's really the demands are for fundamental change. It goes beyond women's rights, but it's that intimate linking that has been quite interesting to see in Iran. The other thing that I've noticed, which is quite interesting, is you know the way women are everyday acts of resistance. They're finding ways, even if they're not going to the protests, to support this. You know, whether it's women who are choosing not to wear the hijab and just go out and walk and see what happens to them. You have women who do wear the chador and the hijab who support the idea of the right to choose. And so they want their daughters to be able to choose and, and are also fighting this in their own kinds of ways. So it's been really interesting to see this development happening in Iran. And I guess I just wanted to hear from you, from your thoughts about in Afghanistan, for instance, how you're seeing this as being different to times in the past. Um, I mean... I think for both Iran and Afghanistan, it's important to acknowledge that, and everywhere, that tyranny cannot, cannot last forever. You know, 43 years, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, things were done differently in Iran. And, um, you know, women have been protesting all the time. They've been uh, saying no to this kind of uh, uh, um, state-led state le misogyny all the time. But how many people actually went out with them. Um, maybe there were a number of women, but uh, not so much. It took time to understand that um, all oppression is connected. And that if women are um, uh, oppressed, the whole society is oppressed. If the, uh, women are oppressed, the structures won't work. The, a lot of things will not work. And that understanding took time. And now it's like the whole of society um, it's kind of going towards that understanding. And in Afghanistan, I think it's very new. We don't have uh, the uh, breadwork freedom movement has been championed by women. Women have been protesting yesterday because the university is open for men and not for women. Women protested today, uh, risking their lives to the level that is not even imaginable, the things that they go through with the Taliban. But they still go and fight. Uh, we do see uh, a few uh, moments of solidarity from men, but it's still not a, a, in a place where uh, the whole society, men and women and all other groups understand that, okay, if women are, are oppressed and suppressed, we are oppressed and suppressed as well. That connection needs to be, to be made and that connection for that we need time. Um, I don't think in Afghanistan, it's that clear for men that they are oppressed as well because women are oppressed. It sees that they see it, people see it as different issues. And I think that moment, when, the moment this connection is made, things will be much easier. And even though Iranians are going through a lot right now, there is so much power, there's so much hope in seeing that like everyone, almost everyone says woman life freedom. That's something we don't have in Afghanistan. But hopefully we will get there. Uh, and hopefully tyranny will not last forever. It's a great point, um, Sahar. That, that specific point about how men and boys are engaging in this movement, I'd, I'd like to hear a little bit more about that. I mean, we're seeing in Iran, you know, men and boys have joined all these protests. They've been just as much fundamental to, to what's going on. How are you seeing it, Tamanna, in terms of the engagement of men and boys in Afghanistan? Uh, so for Afghanistan, I was born between civil war and first Taliban period in Afghanistan. And my sisters, my mother, 
my family, like all of them, they experienced Taliban period last time uh, in the 90s. But then this time, women went out because they had the experience. They were like, if we don't go out, if we don't fight, this will continue. And then also we should appreciate the power of technology, internet, smartphones, so people could document whatever was going on during this time. Um, and also men and women, as Sahar mentioned, we don't really have it in Afghanistan. Only a few men joined women um, and amplified their voices. But that's not enough, I guess. And then um, I believe it's not enough, and they have to contribute more. And uh, also, it's not only about men in Afghanistan. It's about men and women everywhere. So we need to come together, show solidarity. It doesn't have to be going on the streets all the time because women are protesting in a different way in Afghanistan now because if they go out, they get arrested. So they record their videos. They send it and then they promote it. They give interviews. They document, they record their voices, they write. Uh, I was interviewing some artists um, in t late 2021 and early 2022 and uh, they show it through their artwork. Uh, they paint, uh, they uh, write poems, and this is how they uh, protest against uh, the regime. Um, and yeah, we need more men to come together and also women. Um, it's, it's, it's really sad to see that until it doesn't happen to your, yourself, your own house, your own city and country, you don't raise your voice. It's like it happened in Afghanistan when it was only in Kabul, not other provinces. People were calm, and then they were like, okay, it's happening in other cities as well, so we have to raise our voice. So I would like to ask everyone to just understand how difficult it is for all those women to um, protest in different ways. And then um, I ask men to amplify the voices. I know that they are not affected, but their family members are affected by this. If we don't do anything now, like in the next five, 10 years, there won't be an educated woman and girl in Afghanistan. And it's sad. What if it happens to your own sisters, your own daughters, and someone comes, the regime comes and tells you that they can't, this is not an option anymore to get an education. It's a basic human right. Thank you so much. I want to pick up that point you mentioned about technology and how it's been used to amplify. Katie, you've been doing a lot of work about open source digital technology. Can you talk to us a little bit about how you are seeing technology being used in the, co in the context of Iran, like both in terms of amplifying, but also in terms of the government's repression of that too? Yeah, absolutely. I think it, it, it's interesting because you know, anyone in Iran knows how complex the, the Iranian government's own system of online repression is. Um, and has been very, very sophisticated for a very long time. Their national information network is very well established, very well developed, um, but it's also been mirrored by um, a particularly young, growing population that knows how to get around it. And, you know, vast numbers of young people use virtual private networks to access sites that they can't otherwise access um, through the government-surveyed online system. And I think what that's then enabled with this most recent sort of protest movement is a very, very tech-savvy young population that are able to get out to the rest of the world what is going on through various online mediums, whether that's on Telegram um, or whether that's on, on various other Instagram or that kind of thing, which are a lot of them are banned. I mean, Instagram is currently banned in Iran. And so what's interesting is a, as a journalist, I, I keep referring back to that because that's all I can, I can say from my experience is, when you are trying to then document what's going on and, and the role of technology in it, it, it really goes both ways. A lot of the stories we've been doing, we have a large part of that communication with people inside of Iran is just about the medium. How, am I, how are we going to talk? Which platform is safe for you today? Which platform are you going to log on to today? Are you aware that you need to have the two-factor identification on this particular platform? Are we going to speak to that person on Signal today or Twitter today, on Telegram today? And is that there are certain people's accounts that may we think are being accessed at the moment, so let's pause and let's not talk to that person, let's talk to this person. There's a big trend at the moment for effectively doxing protesters where people infiltrate, they believe, government um, act, sort of agents basically working with the Iranian authorities pretend to be activists and then set up accounts and try to talk to activists and get them to share information on where they are and they sort of pretend that they are caring about their whereabouts and so they share information um, which will then endanger them and reveal them to the authorities. All of this is going on while there are also on the street activism and, and protests and that sort of arrival of 
activism via technology and, and communicating with the outside world is it's it's sort of inevitable with the, the sort of arrival of, of technology in that way but it's also really notable that that is something that the Iranians have already got so far ahead of many other activists around the world because it's something they have had to be used to for such a long time. That navigating of the, of the online space, basically, in terms of collecting and connecting with other activists is incredibly important, particularly when you're trying to let the outside world know, which we've not been able to for years. But it's also an incredibly dangerous space. And I have spent a lot of time talking to activists who think that part of the reason they were eventually imprisoned or detained by the authorities for their activism was because their online accounts, their Telegram, their Twitter, their Instagram, their Facebook were hacked, were accessed by government authorities. And that information was then used against them. So it's, it's really a, it's a, it's a two-pronged thing. And I think our awareness, and maybe these are, these are questions I don't know, but our awareness as an international community, as how technology can help activists, but also how it can hinder activists is incredibly important. Um, and the, the, the level of detailed oppression that the Iranian authorities have managed to enact on various different quite well-known platforms, I think isn't necessarily that widely known. It's a really important point, and I think it's something that we constantly feel when we're documenting, having to make sure people are safe. You know, in some ways, you know, like in the course of with the rise of technology, I've, I've witnessed in my career, Skype became one of those big tools that was really useful. Twitter became a massive tool to actually find and talk to people in countries that are otherwise closed to us, right? So when you're actually trying to talk to people, this has became one of the forms. But then it's also an incredible dangerous way as well of finding and um, arresting people too. Yeah, and I think, you know, for example, Google safe search is on in Iran. And it's, it's on because, you know, the Iranian authorities have said that that's a, you know, a, an acceptable thing. It's going to protect people from, from graphic content, from violent content. But that also means that people can't access a lot of protest content. And, you know, that's what, what, what's the real motivation behind enacting that? And what's Google doing about that? What, where's that conversation? And I think there are a lot of conversations that big tech companies are having um, about how they can assist protesters more and whether arguably they are doing everything they can to enable, particularly in the Iranian context, protesters to connect with the outside world and share what's, what's going on. Maybe I can come back to you, Tamanna, about the art and activism. Because you talked a little bit about art. You, know, you mentioned technology, but you also mentioned art. And, and you've, you have a film out on Netflix. It's called In Her Hands. It's actually about a young, the youngest female mayor um, in Afghanistan and her struggle. Um, so it's incredible to see that you've, you know, you've actually documented this. But could you talk a little bit about how you see the role of art and activism in, in this kind of context of the current movements, whether it's Iran or Afghanistan? Um, so I am a filmmaker, and filmmakers are, are also uh, humans, and some of us are activists. So we can't ignore what's happening around us. Uh, when, For example, when we started making that film, um, in her hands, um, I could see the struggle. I could see that this is my daily life. This is what's happening to so many other women. And then um, Zarifa was one of the examples. Um, so it's really important to um, document what was going on. And also at the same time, uh, at the same time, even now, that's one of the ways we can put our emotions. Um, you know, like it's it's not that okay. We write about a topic, we make a film about something, like most of the time it's the things we care about, the things that we are passionate about. Um, and uh, I had a panel with Iranian filmmakers in Berlin two weeks ago, and we talked about the same issues. We just can't ignore it, we are humans, we have to uh, tell stories that are important, uh, that we are passionate about. Maybe just picking up on that point about how to tell those stories, in terms of, you know, we're talking about Iran and Afghanistan, and we want to talk about cross-pollination. How are these movements supposed to support each other? How do we make sure those movements are supported beyond Iran and Afghanistan? What are your thoughts around sort of seeing, uh, are you seeing cross-pollination happening? How are you sort of seeing that? Maybe, Sahar, you could talk a little bit about that. Yes, sure. Um, this is what I'm really passionate about. I'm passionate about movements, and I, I believe uh, movements, and especially feminist movements, they inspire each other. They inspire one another and people learn from one another. And I think this is, for me, just observing uh, two countries are very, like, I'm very passionate about both Iran and Afghanistan. Having the, um, 
the opportunity to know you know the privilege of uh, speaking Farsi and the, uh, sharing the language with Iran. Uh, it's it's very beautiful. It's uh, very hopeful to watch um, how uh, these movements are also b becoming more inclusive. Uh, we have always had issues between, you know, just like the politics of Iran and Afghanistan, but also the politics of being a refugee, uh, Afghan refugee in Iran, and all these things that um, are uh, somehow pushed by, by governments, uh, but, but, uh, and these challenges. But now we see that um, uh, Iranian feminists or Iranian activist groups um, they they bring the message of messages of uh, uh, Afghan feminists and Afghan female protesters in their work, and you see uh, Afghan uh, women with all the challenges they have right now going in front of the embassy of the uh, Iranian embassy in Kabul this year, last year actually, uh, going and protesting for uh, Mahsa Amini. This is beautiful. They, they chant woman life freedom. Um, and Iranians chant uh, breadwork freedom. Uh, there are street arts uh, um, by a collective, uh, um, I mean, uh, street messaging uh, by a collective in Iran where they actually share the messages of uh, female protesters. And these are the moments that we, even though it's very difficult for us to, uh, to locate hope, these are the moments that we need to be hopeful about. We never had these conversations in our region. We never had an opportunity to talk to each other and be like, okay, we actually share these things. We share a language or we share languages and we can um, really understand that we are suffering from the same sort of regime, same sort of rulers who are politicizing religion and all other practices. And I, um, last night I was um, in a panel with uh, an Iranian collective. It was beautiful. It was messages of solidarity going beyond, uh, obviously discussing the challenges of women uh, and people of Iran, but also going beyond that and saying, okay, how can we bring other minorities? How can we bring, how can make, we make it a transnational issue? And um, it's, it's been super inspiring. And uh, I think um, this is something that we never experienced. So we need to welcome it really well. <laughs> Are you seeing some of this as well? Yeah, I remember when um, our sisters Iran, in Iran started protesting, and then I received a lot of uh, videos from protesters, Afghan protesters, from Kabul, Pakistan, other, like Afghanistan, Pakistan, and even some of them were on their way to get evacuated, but they recorded videos and they were like, um, we are here to support our sisters in other side of the border, which was beautiful. And this is one of the things that gives me hope to work with all these women, uh, the protesters, the activists, the feminists, um, and they are the change makers. If we keep calm, nothing will change and all of us will suffer. So it's good that some people are taking the lead and yeah, they are opening the way for us to follow the path. Absolutely, I have to agree. It's been incredibly inspiring. I mean, as heartbreaking as it is to see the brutal repression, it's, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, the inspiration is coming from this level of solidarity. And that inclusivity that you mentioned, I remember thinking that one of the distinctions, distinctly different things about the Iranian protest this time around is that it is crossing ethnic divides. You know, they were, you know, the, uh, Iran is a very rich society with, you know, various ethnic minorities that, that's, that um, live in Iran. And it's for the very first time that we're seeing everyone sort of uniting. The, the Kurdish women's movement slogan has been taken up by the Iranian women in Farsi. So we're seeing the similar protest slogans between Iran and Afghanistan and within Iran as well this inclusivity that's happening and to even have ongoing conversations about how do we continue with that inclusivity is, is just absolutely striking. I just want to add to that saying there is no uh, formula, there is no w one way of doing these things. Everything is a practice, everything we learn from these things. We, uh, we never thought we could see uh, two movements uh, in parallel. We, couldn't, we, we didn't even imagine like a year ago that there would be like breadwork freedom and woman life freedom. We don't know who starts what, but it also, nothing starts, uh, you know, from now. It all, things have been continuing and that's what we know as feminists, as activists, as women's rights defenders, that things, we are a continuation of a lot of work that has been done as much as we feel exhausted and tired. And I feel like this is very important to acknowledge 
that there is no formula. A lot of these things that we see right now, they will inspire more. There will, be, there will definitely be mistakes. There will definitely be people feeling left out. But to have these moments of, of conversation, these moments where we actually come together and say, okay, these are the possibilities, these are the limitations, these are what we could do, I think that can, can open way for more and more uh, conversation and hopefully change. Well, absolutely. I, I agree. We, we stand on the shoulders of giants, really, when it comes to these movements. And one of the things I think that was interesting is going beyond Afghanistan and Iran, right? So we're seeing Indonesian women in Indonesia going outside the Iranian embassy and protesting about what's happening in Iran. So we're seeing beyond, transnationally even, some of this. And it's not just the diaspora movements in, in Europe, the UK, and the US of Iranians coming out and, and sort of protesting, but we're seeing it really go beyond that with the, within the women's movement itself. So that's absolutely striking. I wanted to go back a little bit. I mean, I know we're in a moment of hope right now, but talk a little bit about the challenges. You know, so Katie, you know, maybe we could, you alluded a little bit to some of these bigger technological companies and technology companies and their role in this space. You know, when we're talking about what can people do and think about how to support these movements and what's going on, what, what do people need to know about technology companies and what their role is in this? Yeah, I think it's it's interesting because I think there's a lot of well, the, the big tech, the, the Microsofts, the Googles, the all of them in this world, obviously are, are publicly saying that they are very supportive of, of what's happening in Iran and they're doing everything they can. And I think it's it's interesting when you get into the finer print of what they can do and what they are doing. There's been obviously with the U.S. sanctions on Iran, there has been a lot of difficulties for big tech companies to work there, um, and with Biden's administration then lifting and saying that they are open to a lot of tech companies then in, in you know, opening up a lot of their services to activists in Iran, that is now changing to a certain extent. Um, but it isn't completely changed. And there's a lot of, if you talk to a lot of the Iranian diaspora that are trying to connect with um, Iranians still inside Iran and trying to raise awareness of what is happening, there are a lot of tech difficulties in terms of trying to access certain services, cloud-based services, that a lot of the big tech companies are currently not accessing and not making available. They say because sanctions still make it not available. Um, and there is definitely an element of difficulty in opening up, which calls into question how much, you know, how much flexibility is, is really there. Um, and I think it, it's notable there's already some, you know, I've seen some reporting of, um, of individual employees at some of these companies like Google and whatever trying to help set up access to Iranians themselves because their own companies are not necessarily being that forthcoming with it. Um, it's a very complex area, but I think it is something that we as the international community should have awareness of because these are companies we also deal with. We are also their clients. We are also, um, you know, using these services. One of the things that a lot of um, people, particularly in the state, I work for CNN, and a lot of the, the state side people are interested in is, is, is Musk Starlink, you know, the satellite company that they are trying to set up. Um, and again, awareness of what the reality of that is for Iranians and, and, and for Afghans as well is, you know, it, Musk's Starlink had a huge success in Ukraine and it's been really, you know, cha transformational in terms of accessing um, the internet in a large parts of Ukraine. Um, but the difference with Iran and the importance of knowing the localized context is that with uh, Ukraine, you had a host government that was really enabling this satellite company, the physical equipment to get into the country to then set it up in various areas. With Iran, that's a very different thing. And they, and they actively do not want people to be accessing this content. And there is a lot of experience of people trying to set up satellite dishes and then facing quite severe consequences as a result. There are many people in the diaspora trying to find ways to get Starlink set up inside Iran without it being detected by the government. Um, some are having some success, not many at the moment. Um, but that role of people in the diaspora that are very knowledgeable about tech and how you could set up a Starlink satellite dish and how you could set up various ways to access, you know, basic Google services, for example, um, that the Iranian government currently doesn't allow, are are really quite key to the rest of us then accessing what's going on in Iran or are accessing what's going on in Afghanistan. And these tools are pretty fundamental. And you see that right now with the huge numbers of internet blockades that they've routinely imposed in Iran. They wouldn't be obviously imposing that if the internet didn't have that power. And so the ways to get around it and the way that different technology companies can assist with that, but also crucially make sure they don't endanger further their users um, is, is, is really quite key. 
It's really fascinating. Maybe I can pick up on that issue of challenges. You know, so we've just heard about the technological challenge, but maybe Tamanna, you could talk a little bit about what you're seeing in terms of challenges for women's rights activists now or for the future, emerging challenges that you're seeing for the women, with the women's movement, essentially. Uh, so every single woman who goes out and protests against the Taliban, it's not only the Taliban. They have to start the fight from their own homes. They have to stand up. Um, for their own, you know, um, stand up for themselves and then fight the family first and then go out and fight Taliban. Uh, because we know that whatever Taliban says, it's in uh, favor of men, unfortunately. Uh, and then these women have to take a lot of risks to do that. And it happened to so many protesters. Uh, they got beaten up by their um, male family members back in 2021 when they decided to go out and protest. Uh, some of them were not allowed to return home, so they called me in the middle of the night saying that they need a safe house. But unfortunately, there were no safe houses at the time, so we had to contact our friends and find a place for them to stay for a few weeks. And then uh, financial issue is something else. So basically, they spent all the savings they had from their previous jobs before the Taliban to protest. Like printing a banner might be a simple thing here, but it's a huge thing in Afghanistan. They have to take the risk to go out, print it, because they don't have printers at homes. And then uh, they were asking me, OK, what if we do buy like 100 balance? But then the second one was like, but we don't have that much money. And then the first one was like, OK, we should make it work um, with 50 balance. And then we write our messages. Uh, and then, um, yeah, people can find it, and then more people will join us. So these are the struggles on a daily basis um, facing by protesters. And unfortunately, because the international community, uh, the US government left Afghanistan, Afghan women with nothing but the Taliban, so there was less attention. Um, and it was not um, uh, in their political interest, so it was complicated for them to support the woman. That's why it was a different scenario when uh, women in Iran started protesting, which is sad because all of these people are humans, no matter which part of the world they live in. Um, so yeah, these are some of the struggles um, when we talk about on a daily basis. They are facing all these challenges, and then they, whenever they do interviews on TV, uh, they have to hide for a week. And then where they hide, they can't go back to their families, so they have to find relatives who are open-minded, and then they stay with them. Um, yeah, these are some of the things I noticed, and I thought it's important to share today. Thanks, Tamanna. Sahar, um, what about you? What are you seeing in terms of challenges for women, whether it's now or emerging challenges for the future? Well, I mean, one of the, uh, I mean, Tamano mentioned it very well. Um, Afghanistan was always a very patriarchal uh, society, a very patriarchal c country, different parts. There was, there, there was more intensity. Uh, so the, the, the environment was very enabling. And, and then when the Taliban came to power, it uh, gave a lot of, um, you know, there was, a, right away, there were many, many uh, rollbacks and rights of women. Um, and... Um, Tamana mentioned the printing. Uh, d there were female protesters telling us that the, the printing, uh, uh, you know, companies or shops, they wouldn't print their protest. This paper that we can take it for granted, just print it here and there, or just want to go paperless. They didn't have that that uh, because the Taliban had ordered that there should be any, uh, there shouldn't be any any collaboration with female protesters. And I mean, that's uh, the protest is one part of it, but there's um, this uh, whole humanitarian crisis. And the uh, Taliban's um, recent, I mean, it was in December, uh, order um, that banned women from working with NGOs and um, you know, aid uh, uh, organizations. Um, a lot of, um, many uh, aid organizations uh, suspended their operation in Afghanistan. And that meant um, a, a more, uh, intense humanitarian catastrophe because then there were women who uh, were breadwinners and uh, work with these organizations that were not allowed to work, uh, could not provide for their families, but also there were women and girls at the receiving end of these aids that did not receive it. Um, there are uh, other challenges in terms of, you know, um, there is no employment, there is no job, no, uh, 534 days, um, um, uh, school girls or uh, t 
teenage girls are longing to go back to school, and uh, university girls cannot go. It's it's uh, uh, many Afghan activists and uh, women's rights activists call it a gender apartheid, and we're not very far far from uh, from using that term because it is uh, uh, a very exclusionary um, uh, dynamic and situation. Um, and um, you know, women with all these women guardianship kind of uh, rules and everything, women are denied um, agency, autonomy, anything, any right, and they cannot even uh, work outside home. They cannot work inside home. So there are a lot of challenges. But with especially and specifically with women's rights protesters and those who go in the streets and fight. Um, the world treats it as if uh, um, the U.S. left Afghanistan and then everyone left Afghanistan. No, there are people, there are humans who are fighting for themselves. Uh, um, and then there is no funding. <laughs> there is no... Uh, these uh, organizations, these women who want to register as, a, as an NGO or as a movement, obviously within the Taliban structure, they cannot do that. But also, they, they do not have um, the funding, the support for everyday operation. Um, so it's, it, is, it is a very, very hopeless situation uh, in that sense. And um, unless the Taliban and the international community, and it's important to, to know who we talk to or who we mean when we say international community, unless they make, them, make the Taliban reverse action or course, it is going to be more catastrophic uh, in the future. And you know, no matter how much Afghan women fight inside the country, if the Taliban don't change behavior, or uh, if the world doesn't uh, push the Taliban to change behavior, it will be very, very scary the, the coming years. That's incredibly daunting. And, and I really appreciate you really clearly articulating the, the challenges that women face from the act of even leaving the home to actually become an activist, you know, having to fight their own families to become activists, but also the systemic challenges, humanitarian aid, how do you set up an NGO, how do you do all of this without funding, without resources, with the greater systemic issues that exist. I guess in that question, and you've just alluded to it, is the international community. Like, what should the international community be doing for Iran and Afghanistan? Maybe we can start with Katie and then go that way. I mean, I think generally more understanding of what people are actually wanting and demanding in those countries rather than sort of assuming we know what you want. And for me, all, all that comes down to just communication, you know, un understanding and, and going in with the least bias possible, the least sort of judgment of what you think people will want from those areas and understanding that localised needs and demands really vary. And to get an understanding of that, we need to speak and we need to hear those voices as much as we possibly can. Um, again, you know, as a journalist, that's, it's really just about trying to speak to as many women as possible in Iran, in Afghanistan, and actually hear what they want, and hear what young women want, and hear what old women want, and, and getting those voices and getting access to try and just communicate with them is actually incredibly hard. And I think, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not remotely a coincidence that trying to speak to women online by any kind of social media from Afghanistan and Iran is incredibly difficult at points and it often endangers them if you don't do it correctly. Um, so I think to me it's, it's, it's really just about knowledge, understanding, making sure that we speak as much as we possibly can and, and keep that communication open. And one of the, the great parts about technology at the moment is how much more interconnected we are um, and how you know a huge part of the Iranian movement at the moment has been emboldened by the connection with the outside world, knowing the outside world hears them, sees them, as they face increasingly brutality, increasing brutality and, and torture and horrendous, you know, violence inside the country, knowing that the outside world sees it and it's not going unnoticed, that gives, I believe, a lot of women um, and a lot of, you know, women's uh, um, activists and, and, and supporters and, and men and women um, a, a lot of comfort, you know, that, that this isn't going n unnoticed. Um, so I, I would say it with that. Sure. Tamanna? Uh, there is so much to talk about. Um, so let's, let's accept that it was a mistake to leave Afghanistan back in 2021, the way it happened, and it created all the misery we are facing today as Afghans, no matter uh, if you are inside Afghanistan or outside Afghanistan. Um, and 
as Katie said, communication is important. We, we need to sit, we need to talk, not the way we did back in 2018 with the Taliban. International community communicated with the Taliban directly. Women were not included, only, only a few were included. But whenever we talk about women and women's rights and the people, men are not only the people of the country. So we need to sit with women. We need to listen to them what they want. We are here to amplify their voices, but they are the ones who need to decide what they want. If they are out on the streets protesting, bread, work, freedom, it means that they need bread, work, freedom. If they are in Iran uh, chanting uh, women life freedom, they want women's rights, freedom, and then, uh, yeah. So we need to listen to the women, we need to communicate with them. International community is responsible, we are responsible. We all need to come together to find a solution. We can't just leave Iran and Afghanistan the way it is right now. Uh, so we have to set, we have to put pressure on the Taliban, international community, as Sahar mentioned, like we keep saying international community, but we have to be clear who, which countries are international community. Um, and then they have to take responsibility. We made mistake, it was a mistake, but we have the opportunity to fix it. Um, and this is the time we shouldn't wait for another five, ten years. We have to, whatever we want to do, we need to do it now before it's too late. And we don't want women in Iran and Afghanistan to suffer more than what they did. We lost so many people in both countries to side of the border. We need to stop this. Thank you. Sahar? Um, I agree with Tamanna that, um, Af at least with Afghanistan uh, specifically, Afghanistan is uh, a collective mess and um, trying to change anything or um, trying to um, bring hope or anything is a collective responsibility. Um, and that doesn't mean um, the whole, all the responsibility should, uh, should be with, with the international community or the US or the uh, Western West. Um, there is a responsibility to our uh, very corrupt political leaders who failed the country. There also responsibility lies with, uh, with Afghans and with the activists, when, with the civil society, which are still working in different forms and um, being, some of them being uprooted from the country, some of them being in the country. Um, I think it's important to, um, uh, with the international community, that whoever we mean, whether we mean the UN, whether we mean um, countries uh, engaging with Afghanistan, uh, to make sure to, um, we uh, need to ask uh, very uh, particular, very specific questions to different actors. So if we, meet, if we talk to countries like Norway, we ask them about, why and how they engage with the Taliban, or what, what do they find, uh, how, what have they actually gained uh, from uh, bringing um, um, the Taliban to Norway uh, with a private jet? Uh, that's a very specific question, and because that's something that Afghan women did not want, the people of Afghanistan did not want, it happened anyway. So we can criticize and question in that way and ask, have our own demands. Uh, people of Afghanistan mainly do not want uh, any engagement with the Taliban, and uh, engagement in the sense that they don't want recognition for the Taliban. So this is important for any um, country who is talking to the Taliban. Um, for, for the international community to uh, be aware, whoever it is, that, that uh, any kind of engagement they ha want to have with the Taliban, they should center it around the demand and rights of uh, women and marginalized uh, communities and groups. And um, lastly, if they were having any kind of conversation with the Taliban, they need to make sure that they have cons uh, consultation um, with diverse group of Afghans uh, and Afghan women. Uh, we are coming, we are uh, like humans like any other country. We have uh, our TikTok generation, we have our Instagram generation, we have our Twitter generation. All of these are very political and they can be very simple as well, but we uh, do need to take account these diversities that uh, uh, stay there and they're there. And there are people. People, for me personally, what gives me hope is people and diaspora. And diaspora is a part of reality, it's not the whole reality as the countries can be reality or uh, full reality or not, um, there's so much power in diaspora. Um, 
we have a way more power, both in Iran and Af Iran diaspora and Afghanistan diaspora. There's so much power, there's so much knowledge, there's so much understanding, and there's so many opportunities to do better, to be better, and to practice better work, and to raise awareness. And others, your allies, and uh, you know, allies need to be uh, more, uh, more patient because perhaps you're from countries that were involved with, these, uh, with, with our countries, especially with Afghanistan. And there is a responsibility with allies as well to, be, to do a better job. Thank you so much, and thank you all. I'm just going to give everyone else a chance to ask some questions, otherwise I'll continue all night long. <laughs> so just a time, 20 minutes for you all. I'm happy to take in questions for our panelists, and I have still another final question for them before we end for the evening. Do we have any questions? We have one over here. Let me give you a microphone. Could you say your name just before you ask your question, if that's okay? Thanks. Yeah, it's, it's on the question of what the international community can do. My name's Cathy Troop, and I work for the British Red Cross. And this morning I started the day with a meeting of women from all the National Red Cross Societies and the International Federation and Committee as well. And we were privileged to hear the women who work for the Afghan um, a Red Crescent, sorry, I should have said Red Cross and Red Crescent movement, um, telling us about what their life was like how they lost their jobs, how they were able to go back to work, the daily dangers they face, it was, you know, who their role models are in order to keep fighting. It was incredibly moving, but, you know, and a privilege to be part of such an organization and such a meeting. And there were 150 women on the call. I wish it would have been 1,500, but anyhow, it's just that when at the end people said, so what can we do? What can the international movement do? what can the international community do? Really, all that they could say was, don't forget about us. And that is really quite tragic when you think about what you were just saying, Saha, that there's actually quite little, you know, how can such a mega monolithic machine of repression be fought um, through small, small pieces? Because it does make me despair that we don't see any international organizations such, you know, G7, let's say, pick it from the air, or any big national, NATO, do, are they exercised by women's rights? No, they, that's not what makes them get together and take actions. So I don't know really what you think will bring about the change. I, I would love to know <laughs> if there's more, other than stand in solidarity, which means, you know, of course feel, do any small thing one can, join a meeting, but how can one bring about a real change. Um, thank you. Um, I think, I mean, right now, one of the reasons, this is my analysis, I might be very wrong, but this is my analysis that the, one of the reasons the Taliban have not gained recognition is because Afghan women, not because how the Taliban repressed Afghan women, that's their history, that's their past, that's their recognition, who they are, but how Afghan women protested. And that, I think has not g given the Taliban the, the international recognition that they want because every time they did something, Afghan women went to streets, they fought, they, they were abducted, they were. So if, if a, a small group of women who determined to change their destiny can, can have that much power, you know, and this is not like, this, I'm saying it with like admiring them, but just saying they have stopped something that Taliban are um, craving for. They're doing everything they can, but they're not going to change their course because if they change one step, they would have to move a few steps back and they don't want to change it. But Afghan women at least have worked so, um, you know, so well together and kept the Taliban from gaining that, that thing. I think the international community can do much better. There is there's this responsible, there's one, one person like me as an activist saying international community. There is, uh, uh, and, and other point is the organization, you know, being, a, 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 you know, foreign ministry of a com country, you know where your responsibility is and you know where, what you can do. Uh, I don't mean you as you, but, or your organization, but I think we all know where we, where, where we stand and listening to the people of that country, people and their demands is very important. And, uh, you know, there are, I think there are more ways to 
for the world to um, to put pressure on the Taliban. And the world is not doing it because it's not the US in which girls cannot go to school. It's Afghanistan, it's a different story. I think people don't take it personal. And when you feel it in your bones, and when you feel like, when you can't fall asleep at night or wake up in rage knowing that people in your, girls in your country cannot go to, that's a different story. And people don't do that. Sorry, I went so long. <laughs> Thank you. Tamanna, do you want to answer? Uh, it, it's not an easy question, an easy answer, but we do have ways to do it. I remember I got out of Afghanistan. I had to flee two weeks after Taliban took over because I wanted to make it work. I wanted to finish my film. I wanted to stay with my family. Um, Kabul, where I was home. But then I had to flee. I remember spending two weeks uh, in my first hotel as a refugee. I didn't know what was going on. So I, I saw women protesting in Kabul, Herat, and Mazar. And then I was like, okay, what can I do to help? So I tried to connect them with other women. I, I couldn't write articles myself, but I asked my German friends, my British friends, who were in Afghanistan at the moment, that time. I asked them to write articles. I did interviews for free. This is what I did. This is what was in my power. Um, I was depressed. I was traumatized, but I finished my documentary film. Um, I am advocating every single day. I woke up today in the morning um, crying because I was like, it's a lot of responsibility, 8th of March, celebrating Women's Day. But then you see the situation back home, which is frustrating. It's not easy. And I'm sure it's the same with our Iranian friends and our friends in Ukraine. Um, but also we have different stories in different countries. Uh, but we do what's in our power. As Sahar mentioned, if you're part of an organization, you can contribute. If you're a student, can you become a mentor to another student who is in Afghanistan? Uh, high school, they speak pretty good English, like at least they are working on it. They are reading every single day the books they have with them from previous year because they are not able to go to school this year. And then, are you able to do that? I myself had a, I, I had a scholarship. I went to American University of Afghanistan. And then I decided to make films. I was making films. And then this is where I am today. Are you able to provide that opportunity to another student? If you can do it, we are winning all of us. Uh, so yeah, basically, do what is in your power. We are not asking for, you know, like, Fundings, money, um, it's, it's, you know, simple things. Are you a journalist? Can you write article? Because Afghanistan is not a, on the, you know, headline. It's not on the news anymore. People don't talk about it. Uh, can you organize a screen, in, a screen, a film about Afghanistan? Can you open conversation? Like, it can be simple. We don't have to have a hall or something. We can do so many things online. Um, yeah, these are the simple things we can do to support the women. Uh, it's more than amplifying their voices, uh, and I'm sure they will, they will be happy. I remember interviewing them, and then at the end of the interview, I asked them if they have anything else to say, and they were like, thank you so, they were crying, many of them, saying that, thank you so much for listening to us, because no one listens. And then you become their therapist, and you need your own therapist. It's complicated, but we are humans. We have to do what we can to support them. Thank you, Taman. I think they're really practical examples as well as, you know, what we want from governments too, and you know, what can you do in small acts of solidarity as well, which are absolutely crucial, as you say. They, they really re uh, they reassure people as well. Do you want to add anything, Katie, or we can go back to the audience? Oh, goodness. <laughs> your, your answer is wonderful. Um, I mean, not really. All I can say is I think more than just telling stories and raising awareness, I think I, I'm an investigative journalist, and a, a big part of it is also verification. And the more detail, and even if it is about you know the Iranian authorities or the Afghan authorities, and maybe you know the, the U.S. government or the British government may have other reasons as to how they're going to act with those countries, but the more we document war crimes, the more we can scientifically prove that a certain number of people have been killed, a certain number of women have been sexually assaulted in Iran from this day, from this day, from this day. The more we can log that as accurately as possible, um, even if we can't access the country, even if we can't talk to everyone there, and that's a huge part of what the open source journalism that I do is, the more that record is there, the harder it is to ignore. 
And that's what we found, is the more you present to you know, the US government or the EU, you know, we have found this number of things that are clearly extrajudicial killings or are clearly sexual assaults of this kind or whatever. And the harder that is to ignore and the more you know, that we have that record that if people are eventually going to face you know, a war crimes tribunal or anything like that, that record is there. Um, and I think, that's, I think that is important. Thanks. And, and just to say, we are seeing cases of universal jurisdiction, including like of Syrian officials that times past have, have committed war crimes. So it's, it does happen and it can happen. And it takes a lot of hard work doing the documentation and everything to make sure that it happens to that point of justice. I want to make sure we have, uh, I'm not missing anyone. Is there anyone else out there who has any questions? Yes, I have someone over there. Thanks. Hi, um, my name is Darius. My question, I think, is similar to the one asked before. Um, so you spoke quite a lot about what the international community can do to um, support this cause. And you also mentioned the term um, gender apartheid, which I found really striking, because that would be, you know, one of the, that's one of the heaviest crimes that exist, and it would amount to um, a crime against humanity. So kind of from the human rights perspective, I'm interested to hear your perspective on whether you think that um, international courts, like the International Court of Justice or the, the International um, Criminal Court, have a role to play in this, and if they have maybe played a role in this before, what has been the outcome of that? Yes. Um, yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I, uh, the term gender apartheid has been used uh, um, a lot lately by Afghan activists, activists inside the country, women's rights activists, feminists. And I think it's a moment that we need to, um, uh, we understand it has, uh, um, you know, legal um, understanding of it. You know, there is a legal, um, you know, response to it. But um, it's something that some have been looking into. One of the um, uh, schol feminist scholars, Karima Benun, has been uh, writing a scholarly article about this, uh, the gender, gender apartheid in Afghanistan. Um, and uh, right now we know some uh, feminists who are actually uh, bringing cases together, trying to see if, if it actually amounts to that or not. And, uh, presenting this uh, case, and it's an important one because I've been um, joining these conversations, and they do keep um, uh, uh, saying that it's Afghanistan might not have a present, but it will have a future, and for that future, it's important that we um, acknowledge if this is an uh, and try to find out if this is actually amounts as uh, gender apartheid, and if it does, the countries that are responsible. Uh, you know, we can hold them accountable for the way they would, um, you know, react to or respond to um, uh, an apartheid state, but also holding the Taliban accountable for, for the kind of crimes and the gender persecution that they do right now. Thanks, Sahar. Do we have any other questions? Oh, we have two, three more, four more. Okay, should we take um, one at the very back and then the two, there's two here? Could we take them at the same time? Just yeah, consciously we're running out of time. Yeah. We'll start at the back. Uh, good evening, my name is Nazish. Um, my question to the panel is uh, twofold. Um, just focusing on the men for a second. Um, we've got two types of men, boys who've grown up in Afghanistan, one before this regime and one during the regime. And I wonder if you can spare a moment to share what their experience is and how they're continuing to either champion or become marginalized and their views are no longer heard because they seem like on the ground they could be some champions who could help advocate some of this within the country rather than just the support from the outside. Thank you. Would you mind putting your hands up again just so my colleague can come to you with the mic? Thanks. Hi. My name is Shide. I'm a Conduit Club member, but I'm so from Voice of Iran, the group here who's been organizing the Iran protest for the last 160 days, 22 weeks in London every Saturday and my group are here. Um, we've been out there protesting. We've had 15,000 people at one time in London, but we're struggling to get the media attention. We're struggling to get everybody's awareness that this is a revolution happening in Iran. And we are worried that if you don't get the message across, just like Taliban being flown in on the Norway airline, just like Khomeini being flown in uh, 43 years ago on um, Air France, if you don't get the attention, 
the, the governments negotiating with the Iran government and with the Afghan government will give them the legitimacy that they don't deserve. Uh, we as Iranians know why this time is different. We know why women, men, religious, non-religious, poor, rich are getting behind this revolution and they want regime change. So we need everybody to get it in the media attention. We need it to be in the public attention. We need the public pressure on the government um, to get the revolution happening. And we don't need, as you said, we don't need funds. We don't need anything else. We just need them to stop negotiating with the regime and give, give them legitimacy. So my question is, how can we get everybody else, the non-Iranian, non-Afghanis, other people interested and rallying, writing to their MPs, coming out and saying, saying the same message every day for the pressure to stay on the government. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think we have someone ahead of you, if that's okay. Over here? Oh, okay. let's take one over there. Hi, uh, my name is Iphigenia. I worked at the Center for Analysis of the Radical Right. Thank you so much for the incredible event. Um, a question echoing um, the question that was mentioned um, behind. Um, this has been very insightful in terms of uh, what the regime in Iran and Afghanistan does to set women's lives at risk. I would like to have a bit more of an insight about the day-to-day -day attitudes of everyday people towards the mobilization of women, and what do the regimes do to polarize them potentially against them? Thank you. Really interesting, thanks. So we have a question about men and boys. If you've got it, do you want to start with Sahar, and then we can take yeah. the ones you want, and then we can always share them around. Yeah, I'll, I'll quickly talk about boys, because um, I'm actually, uh, I've been um, doing uh, research on boys' education in Afghanistan. Um, which will be out soon. Um, you can find it on Human Rights Watch website. Um, this is, um, I mean, with boys, uh, as you said, um, we try to, uh, I, we think the way boys are brought, being brought up in Afghanistan right now, um, the fact that they get education, but we question the kind of education they get, we see it as a feminist issue, and it's important for us because um, the, the way the Taliban brainwashed the, the children at school, the way they um, um, teach them violence and uh, misogyny, uh, it's, it's horrific. Um, these boys, some of them who are um, uh, in secondary school and uh, high school l level, they have seen an Afghanistan that was different. It was still very misogynistic, very patriarchal, but it was different. There were still uh, m many opportunities for women. But um, we are definitely very much worried for boys who are growing up in this situation, not, not seeing alternatives, not seeing different uh, differences. Um, boys are not happy. I mean, I've been talking to so many boys from different parts of Afghanistan. They need to, you know, like any, any, any young boy, uh, they want to have their own hairstyle. They don't want to wear a, a, a long um, cloth go, going to school. They want to have a look good. They want to be able to take their uh, cell phones to school. They want to be able to listen to music. And all of these things are being restricted one by one. We, the unfortunate is the Taliban have, uh, have lowered the, 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 um, uh, the bar so much that we actually forget about, you know, it takes all our energy away to look at the whole picture. And the whole, when we look at the whole picture and we get the opportunity to do that, it is very scary. Um, I think it's, it will take some time, but, you know, from, at least from, from my research and from my understanding, boys are not happy in the, with this. And they will one day hopefully understand that this unhappiness, that this anger, that, that this situation is, is connected to the situation of women. And they will uh, hopefully stand by women and you know, make it something closer to what is in Iran, which is um, very sad but hopeful. Thanks. Do you want to take the question about the, how to keep the attention and, or something about the everyday realities of how people are finding it? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, so it's, it's difficult to keep it because like whenever I go and talk on the panels, whenever I talk about my work, I feel like a crazy person going around talking about the same issue every single day, but there is no attention. But I can't do it alone. We have to do it together. And I don't know how many times, uh, times I need to repeat this. Like we all need to feel responsible, like until when? When it, comes, when it happens in the UK, in the US, we will raise our voice. 
it's not we shouldn't only leave it for the people back home or in Iran, Afghanistan or other places where things are challenging. So we all should take responsibility and we do things in our power. I'm not asking for anything more than um, what you have in your power. And also we shouldn't forget the boys and the men in Afghanistan. Like women, they lost their jobs, all the opportunities. These men are responsible to work and feed the family. So we should also understand their situation. It's not black and white. It's reality. And every single day, they have to face this reality. And my family is in Afghanistan. My friends are in Afghanistan. It doesn't mean that when I left, everybody left. I was the lucky one. I left. I have opportunities. I'm working. I'm here. I'm safe. But it doesn't mean that everybody is the same. Uh, so we need to understand their situation. Um, and also, uh, we need to um, celebrate the women who are going out. They, are, they have challenges. Um, it's not easy to do what they are doing, but also we need to understand that it's also difficult for young boys. They are traumatized, they are depressed, like every single boy 17. My nephew is 17 years old, but he looks 40. Every time I see his pictures, I'm, I'm, I, I don't want to see him that way. And there is no way to help him, unfortunately. And he's only one example. Thank you. And I think it's really important to underline that point. When we talk about women's rights, it's, it's an impact on the entire society, right? Men and boys as well. So understanding that the advancing women's rights is important for a healthy society. Katie, do you want to take the last question about how Iranians, are, general um, everyday Iranians, are finding the this, this situation? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not Iranian. Um, so, I, but from 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 talking to um, the the many many women and, and and men that we are for the for the stories we're doing, and I think it also touches on what you were talking about about raising awareness is that there is a a, a huge appetite to be heard, and people. I am still constantly shocked by how much people are willing to risk their lives just by speaking to us. Um, and the, there is this insane level of, of bravery and, and, and awareness of, of what it takes to, to get the outside world to, to, to hear and to listen. And it's not something that, you know, sitting here in London, I can really relate to. And I think, again, it, for me, there's, there's just an insane level of, of, of duty and responsibility to absorb as much as you can the, the, the stories you hear and make sure that their words are, are put out there and I'm, I'm very fortunate to, to have a huge platform to, to put their voices on and to get as many of those voices onto that platform um, is, 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 is a very big focus of mine. I would say that one of the stories we did um, quite recently was on the Iranian teenager Nika Shakarami, um, who, who became a, you know, a, a big figurehead of the movement. And to kind of to your point as well about keeping awareness, even within news networks, there has been a continual level of surprise at how huge these stories go, how viral they go. You know, there is, there is an appetite. People will watch, people will read. We need to just keep making those stories. We need to keep reporting. We need to keep talking to people. There is an appetite if you tell the story well and you make sure that the right voices are heard. Um, and that also goes to, 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 to not just telling their stories, but also making sure that their stories are, are, are put in front of people in power. Um, and, and, you know, working for, a, for an American network, I know the CNN's played in the White House and that kind of thing. There is a responsibility for that um, in, in terms of making sure women's voices are heard, particularly, again, you know, I think seeing right now the number of women that are getting detained in Iran, getting um, put in prison in Iran, and the experiences they're finding behind bars is, you know, it's, it's, it's unfortunately not new, but it is expanding rapidly at the moment. Um, and again, keeping a focus on that and, and shedding light on that and doing everything we can to make something that they are trying to hide from the outside world completely visible to the outside world um, is, you know, something I, I find very important in my job. Thanks, Katie. We've got a few more questions. Let's take another round. We've got two there. Any I think we might actually have to wrap up there. I'm so, so, so we can't sorry. can't take two more? Um, okay. So, so sorry, but I'm conscious that um, I know Katie has to run to get a flight, but I know that uh, Rofna, Tamana and Saha will be still around. And we do also have the bar open at the back. So please stay around. I know there are so many questions still to come. So please do stay on. 
So yeah, thank you so much. And I please do come back to the panelists and have those uh, ask those questions there. Just a huge thank you to everyone, to to you all for joining us today, and to you all. <laughs> And a, a quick heads up, the Human Rights Watch Film Festival will be starting soon on March 16th. That We have an impressive Iranian film, The Seven Winters in Tehran. But you can also catch In Her Hands on Netflix by Tamanna as well. So please do look out for our, our film festival brochure. And we look forward to seeing you at more of our events. Thank you. <laughs>